When you're in prison, did you know there were people outside supporting you? How much can a person in prison know about outside world? Hello, I am truly happy to be here, to be here in the condition that I'm in right now, all these intense emotions, meetings with my relatives and people close to me. I am open to talking with you. We have a certain history of meetings. I am grateful to everyone who aided with my release, be it some small efforts or bigger ones, flash mobs, letters. Did this information reach me? Yes, it did. First of all, there was this so-called inmate postal service. If anyone managed to get their hands on a Ukrainian newspaper and there was something about me or about the events regarding my release, they would pass it on to me. They would pass the information on from different floors, through the cleaners. So I would get hold of this information because in general, any communication with the outside world was prohibited and they would make sure we didn't use any phones or anything. But we received this news and of course it was invaluable psychological support that people remember you and are fighting for you. You realize that it is a long fight so you collect yourself and all your patience. But it is this support that allows you to live through these minutes, hours, days, months and years. So thank you all. Well, I can tell you many were and still are afraid to make too much noise because they don't know how it may harm you. Your name was mentioned during the Minsk negotiations, so the chances of your release increased. Or when someone wrote about you or a photograph of you with the Ukrainian flag emerged, this could also affect you in some way. How risky were these things? On the one hand, yes, it increases your value and you become an object for trade, so you could disappear from the list and then reappear on it again. But on the other hand, it was a protective factor. They see that someone holds you in high regard. But also, you're in both the Ukrainian international spotlight. Everyone treats you with more care. They won't use force against you. This spotlight protects you and your life, and therefore it saves your life. Because the people who are there with no support can just disappear off the face of the earth. What do you know about the people who are still there? For example, there are some well-known soldiers like Karinkov and Hlonder. There is also Stanislav Aseyev, who is a journalist and a blogger. They are still in prison. What happened to them? Maybe there are also some people who we are not aware of yet. Nobody heard about them. They weren't as lucky. How many of them are there? Yes, there are too many of those, of course. We don't have reliable information on their whereabouts. But we follow Aseyev's fate. He is one of my former students. The same with Fomichov. And even when we were there, we did our best to receive information about his whereabouts. He is currently being held at the old Izolatsia factory in Donetsk. There is something of a prison or a concentration camp there, and not just for political prisoners. It's under the DPR's state security ministry. It's like their prison. Aseyev is there now, but there are also other locations, like basements that belong to the so-called state security ministry. There are many basements, some of them we don't even know about yet. What conditions were you held in? Well, it varied. At first I was at the state security ministry's basement, and those were the most difficult, horrible conditions. Then it got a little better. The first nice period was when I was in a little cell. There were some difficulties, but at least you could live there. Later I was relocated to a place that was formerly used as death row in Soviet times. These days they hold people with life sentences, or those they want to torture in there. Those were very difficult conditions because the cells were extremely small, and you could barely move inside them. You could either sit or lay down. There is a hole in the floor right next to you, which they call a toilet. It was very tough. How many of those they consider political prisoners were there? Those who they consider political prisoners. It was just everyone who didn't agree with their Russian world rhetoric, their Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic rhetoric and so on, basically everyone who disagreed with them. Who were the people who worked as prison guards? Did you talk to them? If we're not talking about the state security ministry, but about those places where people serve obediently, those who work in detention centers and prisons, well, most of them only work there because they have nowhere else to work. Some of them stay there because they've been working there for a long time. And you can't say that they have some sort of stance or strong political views, no. These are the people who want to survive. Many of them reminisce about times when, as they say it, we still had Ukraine. Because they are worried about their financial status. And of course, they are worried 
worried about the amnesty process. They give out hypothetical prognoses to what will happen when Ukraine arrives to Donetsk and what will happen to them individually. Starting from the basics, will their work experience be counted towards their pensions, or maybe they will even be held accountable for carrying on working after the occupation? Yes, they're worried, of course, they're worried. And regarding the attitude of the guards, the ones who are just ordinary people, well, there's no animosity whatsoever. And these people in so-called state security ministry, who are they and what are they like? They're just doing their job. They're in a situation where there's no going back. The problem is that if you speak with the civilians, with the potential civil society, with those who are only serving obediently, who take part in this repressive machine, they will not back down. They will push the idea that once, quote-unquote, Ukraine arrives, there will be problems, and they scare the rest of society with that. There are many people in the state security ministry who used to serve in Ukraine's state security service, the SBU, and there are people who are being curated by Russia's federal security service, the FSB, and you can just feel the FSB's presence in there. There are people who used to serve in the militia, and roughly speaking, they traded their oath and moved to a certain establishment. They know that they're under threat. All of their names are in the Miratoritz database, which is their biggest fear. These people have a problem, and they're considering either fleeing to Russia or forming guerrilla groups if they stay. They are scared of Ukraine. You said that the FSB's presence can be felt there. How does it manifest itself? First off, the state security ministry is curated by the FSB. It's practically an open secret. Everyone knows about it. Even the local DPR administration cannot influence the state security ministry because the state security ministry comes to the FSB directly, and you can feel it. Any office you go in, you'll find portraits of Stalin, Putin, and then Zaharchenko. Can you say that anything has changed in Donetsk in the last years? Of course, the last two years you were in prison, but did anything you could mention? The moods are changing, of course. I had an opportunity to find this out from the ordinary prisoners who were detained for criminal cases and then sent onward to prison colonies. Just recently they were on the outside. They have a feeling of futility. Everyone says that the region is not viable. Factories stop working. The majority of the mines don't operate anymore. People look for easy money. Everything that could have been stolen has already been stolen. And all the metal parts in the city have been looted. So what's next? How do we live? Those who have a stable job find their, their ways to survive. There are whole regions where people had industrial jobs. They worked in the factories, mines, and other establishments. So what is to be done? To leave, mostly to Russia. If they have relatives, they push them to move to Russia. Or to Ukraine. But of course, this is done with more caution. And then there are rumors that the people from Donetsk are not wanted in Ukraine. That if they go back, they will be pariahs there. They really believe this and pass these stories on to each other. These cases really do exist, but all people are different. Some are hot-tempered, we should understand that. But people see what they want to see. Igor Anatolievich, you already mentioned, and we know that you've been tortured. These are very painful memories of you. These people absurdly accused you, a scholar of possessing grenades. When they interrogated you, did they actually believe the accusation they were leveling against you, or was it just for show? You can call it a show that's been acted out many times, when they point a gun at you and say they're going to play Russian roulette and then spin the cylinder. Or when they just fire at you, there are many such cases. Some were tortured with electricity, that of course was horrible. The torturers knew that they just needed to extract a confession primitive and unprofessional. They have a task, and this task is very simple, to force charges upon people, extract a confession, and then they pass the case on to the investigator, and then on to the court, and so on. They need this to be done fast. They have other things to do. They torture everyone with hatred and shout, we are the Russian world that came here. I did not see them. I had a sack over my head. But all these times I imagined these Bashian characters, these strange characters with plague masks. That's the image I had in my mind. You said that this torture is the same as what was used by NKVD, the secret police in Soviet times. Yes, and they didn't try to hide it. They said, you realize that we are the successors, the direct successors of the NKVD and of the KGB, and not of some feeble SBU. That was what they shouted while torturing us. You won't come out of here alive. You know this, they said. They managed to break some people. 
We can't blame these people. Every person is a limit, a limit of resistance. That's why I told them, you realize that the more you push me, the more I will resist. It's just part of my nature. And they responded, you are the exception, most people break really fast. I understand that they're only human. We're all living things, prone to psychological damage, and our nervous systems have a limit too. There's a threshold of pain, a threshold of feeling, a threshold of fear of what will come next. When they told me, we'll carry on with you tomorrow, they carried me in a sack and into the basement. I wondered whether I'm afraid of death. And I thought, no, actually I'm not. I realized I had no fear. That was the first time in my life I realized that. The thing that I'm afraid of the most is that my family and my loved ones will suffer. This is the threshold they took advantage of, and they threatened me. They've threatened you when they detained you. Can you tell us more about that? They threatened me when they detained me, and they threatened me when they tortured me. I always dreaded the moment they turned to my family and my loved ones. They use our soft spots, and for many it's their families. There is this one guy, he's still in Donetsk, so I won't mention his name. He's doing quite well because he hasn't got anyone. It's easier for him to cope because he hasn't got a soft spot. Everyone knows this, it's a mechanism that has been used since the NKVD times. You said that many turned to you in prison, you talked to many people there. You did some yoga, you prayed. Yes, the breathing exercises helped me. It's the regiment I, I turned to. I tried to stay in shape. I gave out advice and recommendations. I helped people. In those conditions, it's important not to shut down. You can't just stay in your own bubble. Socializing is crucial. Some prisoners wanted to talk to me. They wanted my advice specifically. They shared their stories, they cried, and I listened to them. Were there any separatists from the so-called DPR in prison? What were their cases? They openly say that the DPR is culling its ranks. These are mostly the people who went to war in 2014 and 2015. Some of them regret fighting, they claim it was because of peer pressure. Everyone else does it, so I will too. Or, for example, they were offered free drugs in exchange and so on. The majority of them ended up on the outside, some turned to theft instead, some started living normal lives. But they were removed from the DPR's ranks. Some of them were set up. They shared various stories of how they fought in Ilovaisk, in Debaltseva. They said that, that it was mostly the Russian army there and that the DPR was just doing the sweep operation afterward. They shared a lot of insights. Tell us how we can all help. You talk to the people who have just been released. Yes, they were welcome, but what's next? Indeed, it was a very warm reception, and I am very grateful for it. It's an inspiration to this day. I talked to the other released prisoners. We still talk over the phone. Everyone was shocked in a good way. Thank you, Ukraine. Thank you, everyone who welcomed us so well. But this wave is already gone, and now we're on the coast. It's a sandy coast. There's emptiness. The families are reuniting. What's next? There are no jobs, no accommodations, no money, no essentials even. Some don't even have clothes. They wear hospital clothes. What's next? Some even try to stay in the hospital for a bit longer so that they have something to eat and can escape the condition they used to be in. People need a roof over their head, a substantial diet. They need time to adapt, to find their place in society, to find a job. They persisted, they returned, with losses, with really big losses, psychological, physical, material, emotional. But they need our help. When you were detained, what were the things you would like to do, first of all, when you'll be released? I want to speak the words of love as often as possible. In this fast-moving life, we often forget to declare our love. It is very important to speak about it. The question of returning the Donbass. The Minsk process has largely stalled. What should we do? The longer it goes on, the longer this process will take. One thing is absolutely clear. We should never, and under no circumstances, give up our territories. It would be a terrible precedent. No way, it's our land, and that's clear-cut. It's not a subject for discussion, no matter what anyone wants or says. And it's not just a territory. It's also the people, our residents with Ukrainian passports and their mindsets and opinions. Yes, they've been subject to the ideological propaganda of the so-called Russian world. We need to fight for these people too, they are human beings. 
it's hard, and with time it becomes even harder. We've already lost a lot of time. What you said about the Minsk process, that it dragged on for so long, it's baffling. And the self-proclaimed Donetsk leaders use this to their advantage, to stretch their roots even deeper. It's like a cancerous tumor, it metastasizes further and further. I've been told that part of the nation supports the resolution of the conflict by force, and another part wants dialogue, a peaceful resolution. As always, the truth is somewhere in the middle. We need both kinds of efforts. We need to strengthen the Ukrainian army to make it more powerful. It needs to be defensive in its nature. We don't want to attack, but it still requires us a lot of work. On the other hand, we need to use force. We need to stand by our borders and restore them. The other thing we need is for the powerful and healthy society to finally mature. As I said, they have different stances, but they should have one goal, the sovereignty and unity of Ukraine. We know that for Ukraine to develop and flourish, we need a civil society. The other thing is that I think our society lacks maturity, hence why there are, are polar tendencies. Why is there a need for a civil society in this case? To establish a connection with the people on the other side of the demarcation line. Many retain family and friendship ties with them. We just need to meet these people, to talk with them, to calmly explain our position. One prisoner's mother, we spoke with her before his release, said that she wants to apologize for the country failing to achieve what her son dreamt of while he was fighting in the Baltseve. A lot of people are concerned that former prisoners might be disappointed after they are released. I always tell my students that in order to not get disappointed in people, we need to not make idols. I will not get disappointed in anyone simply because I love people the way they are. I love my country the way it is. Yes, Ukraine is corruption, and yes, there are many other problems, but we chose the right direction to move in, to the global society. In spiritual practices, there is this idea that the road is also the destination. What is enlightenment? Enlightenment is a process. It's when you walk in the tunnel, and as you walk, you see more and more light. We're still walking in this tunnel, but we're walking in the direction of the light, and demanding for all of the light to come at once is too big a demand. But should we still demand it? Yes, we should.